headlines for this hour on VTV News. National Assembly Standing Committee opens Q&A session. And Vietnamese industry surge with record trade surplus. In our war news, Russian President Vladimir Putin claims landslide of Russian's election victory. Broadcasting from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, VTV News starts right now. Hello, it's 3 p.m. local time in Hanoi, and you're watching VTV News. The National Assembly Standing Committee began a Q&A session on finance and foreign affairs on March 18, chaired by National Assembly Chairman Vương Đình Huệ as part of his ongoing 31st sitting. National Assembly deputies asked the finance ministers questions about the management and oversight of insurance business activities and services, especially in the life insurance sectors. They also questioned the evaluations and licensing procedures for financial service companies and the enforcement of laws related to the lottery, betting, and casinos. In the area of foreign affairs, lawmaker asked about strategies for protecting Vietnamese citizens abroad, how to address legal violations committed by Vietnamese citizens abroad and foreign nationals in Vietnam and safeguarding the rights and interests of Vietnamese fishermen. They also inquired about the status of bilaterals and multilateral agreements implementations, particularly measures to enhance economic trade and investment cooperation. And in after the opening session, Minister of Finance Ho Duc first answered questions from National Assembly deputies about a group of issues in the field of finance. During Monday morning session, several National Assembly deputies discussed pressing issues. These included proposals to adjust personal and dependent family tax allowances, as well as strategies to regulate the gold and foreign exchange markets. Is the Ministry of Finance considering plans to increase the family deductions for individuals and dependents in future personal income tax assessments? Starting in 2025, the personal income tax revision will commence. During this time, the Ministry of Finance will seek input from the public, agencies, and organizations. This process will include a re-evaluation of the family allowance factor. Given the significant fluctuations and notable increases in domestic gold prices, we request that the Minister of Finance recommend solutions for effectively managing the gold market. To reduce gold and dollar prices, in my opinion, we must implement measures affecting supply and demand, including import and export policies. Decisions on whether to import gold and stricter regulations on trading are essential. Several National Assembly deputies expressed interest in creating legal regulations for lotteries, betting, casinos, and prize-winning electronic games. They are particularly interested in understanding these activities' impact on economic growth and local communities. Could you please explain what changes have been made in the legal framework for the business of electronic games with prizes and betting in recent times? Why has the Ministry of Finance not yet licensed any betting businesses? We have various betting categories, including football, horse racing, and greyhound racing, which have yet to be implemented. The initial delay was due to the lack of provisions in the betting law for organizing football betting. Currently, we must formulate specific legislation to create a legal framework for these betting activities. The government has recently enacted Decrees No. 32, which outlines several preferential policies to promote industrial cluster development. This decree provides investment incentive for industrial cluster located in social economically disadvantaged area and those investing in the construction of technical infrastructure for special designated industries and professions. The state will support up to 30% of the total capital for projects related to industrial cluster, technical infrastructure, construction. Funding for industrial cluster development activities led by the Ministry of Industry and Trade will be secured by the central budget 
while local budgets will finance locally conducted activities. The decrease will come into effect on May 1st of this year. European businesses' demand for new investments and factory expansions in Vietnam is on the rise, as noted by the European Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, Eurocham. According to Eurocham, Vietnam holds multiple advantages, including stable human resources, robust infrastructure, and administrative procedure reform. Eurocham recommends the dynamic investment promotion efforts at the local level, especially in key industrial areas such as Hanoi, Quảng Ninh, Thái Nguyên, Bắc Ninh, Đồng Nai, Bắc Giang, and Ho Chi Minh City. These areas have attracted 75% of new projects and nearly 82% of the country investment capital in the first two months of this year. In the first two months of this year, businesses launched 13 corporate bond offerings, a mass of over $303,000 this and this marked an approximately 8.2-fold increase from the same period in the previous year. It illustrates a strategic shift by companies towards medium to long-term borrowing as a method to decrease costs and expand the productions and market presence. More than 87% of bond buyers are now institutional and international investors, a change from previous years when individual investors constituted a third of the purchasers. Businesses extended their bond issuance terms by over two years at about 2% lower interest rates in the first two months of the year. This indicates a focus on investing in medium and long-term projects by businesses. In addition to the two public issuances, the majority are private issuances by small and medium-sized enterprises. These are done with the aim of raising medium and long-term capital. We recognize that the market now attracts professional organizations and investors, moving away from amateur participation. With the establishment of laws and reputable issuances, more professional investors will join the market. The bank's goal is to mobilize large amounts of capital at low interest rates to increase resources. To achieve this, it plans to issue six corporate bonds with a total value exceeding 226,000 US dollars. All of these bonds are asset-backed, with a maximum term of up to eight years. The expected interest rate on our bond issuances is anticipated to be equal to the 12-month over-the-counter savings rate plus approximately 2% per annum. Corporate bonds are crucial for raising medium to long-term capital. In developed countries, their market size reaches 97% of GDP, 35% in Singapore, and just 15% in Vietnam. To boost this proportion and enhance investor confidence, experts suggest implementing clear regulations on the mechanism for monitoring and reporting the use of capital post-issuance by businesses. The export turnover in the first two months of the year exceeded 59 billion US dollar, marking an increase of over 19% due to improved export to primary markets. In particular, the trade balance of goods saw a surplus of over 4.7 billion US dollar, the highest level for the same period in the past decade. This indicates growth momentum in sectors such as agriculture, forestry, fishery, constructions, and services. More to follow. This new strategy has opened up opportunities in the U.S. market, particularly as orders from traditional markets such as South Korea and Europe have declined. Consequently, they anticipate generating $12.1 million in revenue this year. In 2024, our company anticipates producing over 2 million pairs of shoes. Despite a 20% increase in staff, revenue has doubled compared to when older materials were used, Conversely, the import turnover of goods in the first two months of the year increased by 18% compared to the same period last year. The primary imports include machinery, equipment, raw materials, and fuel for domestic production. Export industries are actively restructuring to accommodate orders. In response to the challenges faced in 2023, businesses have undergone extensive restructuring, including overhauling and streamlining their production processes and reorganizing their workforce. The Ministry of Industry and Trade asserts that the current significant trade surplus is a testament to the business sector's successful market exploration. Improved competitiveness of export goods and effective resolution of challenges. This success has been notably supported by the government. 
our largest trade surplus is with the U.S. market, with the EU coming in second. Notably, in markets where we typically experience trade deficits, such as Japan, we have achieved a trade surplus in the last two months. The highest trade surplus in the first two months of the year also contributed to macroeconomic stability. It increased foreign currency resources amid the rising value of the USD, creating room for the state bank to stabilize exchange rates and control inflation. And before moving on to some other news, let's take a look at foreign exchange rate for today, March 18th. on VTV News. Improving strategies for forest fire prevention and management in forest adjacent provinces. And Vietnam Classical Music Festival 2024 concluded. Since the beginning of the year, manufacturers and importers have started to comply with Extended Producer Responsibility or EPR regulations. These rules outlined in the 2020 Law on Environmental Protection aim to recover and recycle product packaging. This effort seeks to alleviate the financial strains of solid waste collections and treatments in urban regions. However, it's crucial to understand that the collection, transportation, and recycling system rely significantly on informal waste workers. Are therefore, encouraging these worker participation in waste management poses a challenge for local authorities. Hoa has been an informal waste worker for nearly 20 years, collecting various types of waste, including paper, cans, and foam boxes. I buy cans, paper, and iron. On an average day, I earn about six U.S. dollars. Estimating the size of this informal labor force is challenging due to their irregular work schedules. Consequently, scrap collectors, like this woman, encounter difficulties due to a lack of sufficient materials to sell to recyclers. I hire a sorter and then deliver it to larger companies. Our earnings depend on the health, mobility, and productivity of the waste workers, which directly impacts our profits. In Hoi An, the volume of recyclable scrap largely depends on informal waste workers. They are responsible for collecting and sorting materials from households and the city's landfill. This workshop has highlighted the importance of reinforcing this labor force's role and encouraging their active participation as a crucial element in the waste value chain. The current Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR policy, only supports recyclers and overlooks the essential contributions of informal waste workers. Collecting data on the participation of informal waste workers in managing various types of waste remains a challenge. The requirement for these self-employed individuals to register for informal training is particularly burdensome. Tracing the origin of business waste poses significant challenges. The primary goal of the EPR policy is to inspire businesses to use eco-friendly designs, minimize waste, and boost collection and recycling efficiency. However, this shift will take time. As some vehicles can't navigate narrow lanes, informal waste workers will play a crucial role in improving the collection of packaging materials for recycling. The South Central and Central Highlands regions are experiencing prolonged dry weather, low water levels and reservoirs, rivers and streams are causing drought. Currently, 634 reservoirs in these regions are operating at less than half of their original capacity. Notably, 45 lakes in Bình Định, Ninh Thuận, Bình Thuận, Con Tum, and Đắk Lắk, Đắk Nông, and Lâm Đồng are nearly dry. The peak of the drought is predicted to occur in the next two months as El Nino uh, continues. Temperatures are expected to rise by 0.5 to 1.5 degrees Celsius more than average. A 15 to 30 percent shortfall in rainfall is decreasing river flows by 15 to 50 percent compared to the same period each year.
In the southern provinces, prolonged heat has resulted in dry weather, increasing the risk of forest fires. Forest management and protection units are always prepared to address these issues. To prevent and combat forest fires more effectively, the involvement of residents is crucial. Protecting forests also safeguards people's livelihoods. In this forest protection group, members frequently travel between forests. When they encounter villagers near these forests, they consistently emphasize a crucial message, the precautions necessary to prevent forest fires. We educate people about forest fire prevention and urge them to report any smoke to local forest protection teams. This company manages a forest area spanning over 38,000 hectares, spread across five communes in Hengping district. Numerous residential areas are located along the forest's edge in these communes, and much of the residents' production land is intertwined with the forests at high risk of fire. After receiving reminders, these households now understand the necessary actions to reduce the risk of forest fires when burning and clearing fields. Before clearing and burning the fields, we mark the boundaries. When burning, we need to coordinate with the fire protection unit. According to the Forest Protection Department of Henghua Province, over 61,000 hectares of both natural and planted forests are at significant risk of fire. The local community, in collaboration with forest protection checkpoints, aids forest owners in quickly identifying fire hazards. The firefighting plan primarily relies on the company's forces. However, with such extensive forest areas, the participation of local residents and authorities is crucial. The forests surrounding villages in Hengving, Henghua province, are crucial to the lives of the Rakhalei people. They clear land near the forest and raise livestock within it. Even minor mistakes during these activities can lead to wildfires. Recognizing this, residents living near the forest understand the importance of protecting it from fire risks during the dry season to protect their livelihoods. Iced tea, a common Vietnamese drink, is offered free of charge on many street corners in Ho Chi Minh City. It serves as a thirst quencher for anyone in need, including outdoor workers. More than a kind of gestures, these iced tea kettles symbolize the city's spirit of mutual care and support. Chi has recently gotten into the habit of pulling up to the sidewalks to enjoy free cups of iced tea. It's a habit he picked up when crossing the busy streets of the city center. It's been scorching hot these days, and these free iced tea bottles are a wonderful help. I'm grateful to whoever set them up for workers and passers-by. In the blazing tropical heat, a free cup of iced tea is more than one could ask for. Most of those who provide the bottles do so out of kindness. I just wanted to do something for workers and drivers whose work involves being outside. It feels like a burden to have to stay outside in this heat, let alone work. With this approach, manufacturers consistently refill the bottles when they're empty. Their contributions have enabled some street vendors to reduce their daily expenses. Nothing beats an ice-cold cup of water. They often bring out the bottle early in the morning and fill it up regularly. I believe this is a meaningful act of service. It's one of the things that defines Ho Chi Minh City. It's a city of kindness where people look after each other. The bottled water at the stand is carefully protected from heat and clean cups are provided. This IT stand is an initiative by the Magdina Paris Church to offer free water and inspire more people to participate in these volunteer activities. I order two bags of ice every day and refill the bottle every 30 minutes. It uplifts me when people can quench their thirst in hot weather. These complimentary kettles of iced teas are widespread throughout Ho Chi Minh City. They symbolize the genuine kindness and compassion of the local people in the country's most popular city. Vietnam reopened to international tourism after a two-year suspension due to COVID-19 pandemic. And despite the ongoing challenges faced by the global tourism industry, Vietnam has made significant recovery strides. 
Thanks to innovative policy and institutional building, Vietnam has the potentials to develop tourism into a key economic sector. In 2023, international tourist numbers rebounded to 70% of 2019's figures. In the first two months of this year, Vietnam received 3 million visitors. Over the past two years, the Prime Minister has led three national tourism conferences and issued numerous resolutions and directives to expedite tourism recovery. A notable development is the extension of the temporary stay period for individuals entering the country under unilateral visa exemption to 45 days. This policy is currently under consideration for further flexibility. Over 1.5 billion people, as we know more and more middle class are rising, they're getting digital passports, they're willing to travel. This creates an immense influx of tourism spend in both each other's countries. Experts suggest that it is essential to persistently promote policies that support businesses in the tourism service supply chains. There needs to be a policy to create conditions for the development of small and medium-sized businesses. Directive No. 8 from the Prime Minister explicitly states the necessity to reboot the National Steering Committee for Tourism in order to unify the industry's development strategy for both short- and long-term periods. The National Steering Committee on Tourism will handle and resolve complex and interdisciplinary problems, contributing to the coordination of cooperative activities, especially regional and interregional links between ministries. According to the World Tourism Organization, Vietnam ranks among the top 20 countries with the most potential for tourism. By 2024, Vietnam aims to attract 17 to 18 million visitors, matching the number in 2019. The 2024 Vietnam Classical Music Festival concluded on Sunday night at the Dai Lat Opera House. The festival brought together 100 artists from both domestic and international backgrounds. Organized by the Vietnam Youth Music Institute and Vietfest, the festival included a week-long series of activities in various venues across Dai Lat City. Highlights of the festival were the performances held in Hillside Street, where classical music was combined with painting exhibitions. These performances attracted a large audience. The festival's success has spurred numerous ideas for future activities, further establishing Dalat as a creative music city, a title awarded by UNESCO in October of the previous year. Coming up next in our war news. President Vladimir Putin claims landslide Russian election victory. And U.S. Army hosts multinational Allied Spirit 24 a six side in Germany. Following the release of data by the Russian Central Elections Commission, CEC, showing that Russia incumbent President Vladimir Putin is poised to win the eight presidential elections with 87.32% of the vote. President Putin gave a victory speech at the campaign headquarters, and this event occurred after 95.04% of the balut had been counted by the late Sunday. Speaking from the campaign headquarters in Moscow following the preliminary results of the presidential election, Russian President Vladimir Putin expressed his gratitude to the Russian people for their trust and support. Putin emphasized that the Russian people are the sole source of the country's strength. Despite facing numerous challenges, he believes that Russia will overcome them if unity is maintained. He also stressed that issues related to the campaign in Ukraine are a top priority for his new term. We cannot be threatened by anyone, no matter who tries to frighten us or how they attempt to suppress our will and consciousness. As I have already stated, no one has ever succeeded in doing anything like this in history. It has not worked now, and it will not work in the future. The Russian leader pledged to devote all efforts to addressing the country's immediate tasks and achieving goals for a stronger, more resilient Russia. This outcome indicates that President Putin is set to begin a new six-year term. If he completes it, he will become Russia's longest-serving leader in over 200 years. The South Korean military reported North Korea's second ballistic missile launch of the year. 
According to Japan's defense ministry, North Korea seemingly launched two missiles, both of which landed outside Japan's exclusive ec economic zone. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida of Japan swiftly denounced the actions, citing that they posed threats to regional peace and security. North Korea has yet to respond to these allegations. This launch took place after the South Korean and United States militaries concluded their large-scale annual joint military exercises involving twice the number of troops compared to the previous year. The Allied Spirit 24 exercise led by the U.S. Army continued at their training facilities in Hohenfels, Germany on Saturday, March 16. This large-scale exercise focuses on force readiness and interoperability between NATO and key partners. Only 20% of the participants are from the U.S. Army, with the German Army 41st Panzer Gurneider Brigade being the primary training audience. This exercise is also part of the multinational Quadriga 24 exercise, the largest exercise of German land forces since the beginning of Russia's conflict with Ukraine. The European Union and international aid organizations have warned that without the lifting of restrictions and obstacles to aid delivery processes, Gaza faces a potential famine. The European Commission president stated on Sunday that Gaza is on the brink of famine, emphasizing the urgency of reaching a ceasefire agreement to release hostages and allow additional humanitarian aid to reach Gaza. Asfarm, an international organization, has criticized Israel for hindering efforts to deliver aid to the Gaza Strip, claiming it violates international humanitarian law. Asfarm reports that about 1.7 million Palestinians constituting, constituting 75 percent of the Gaza population are at risk of severe farming. Meanwhile, the United Nations Children Fund UNICEF declared that over 13,000 children have died in Gaza. Many children are suffering from extreme malnutrition, with some even too weak to cry. And now, as usual, let's continue with the weather forecast. And that's all the news for today. To rewatch your program, you can log on to vitvigo.vn or download a mobile application Vitvigo. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.